in workshop. My name is Sabri Kais, and I will be chairing this fifth session. And we have an exciting uh, three talks. The first one will be about Kabri clusters. And then we have a green function. And the third wall talk will be about uh, bear theories. And the first talk will be given by Jotor Biedo from uh, Michigan State University. And the floor is yours. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sabra, for this uh, nice introduction. And I'd like to begin by thanking David and Christian for the wonderful invitation for organizing this great meeting. It's a wonderful idea, uh, really. Uh, and um, as you can see from the title, uh, I'll be trying to discuss uh, some ways to approach uh, exact or nearly exact in practice quantum chemistry by uh, combining uh, quantum, Monte Carlo, some, uh, uh, quantum Monte Carlo stochastic techniques uh, and selected CI with Kappa cluster computations. Before I go on, I'd like to thank uh, my, uh, and recognize my co-authors, uh, Jwin Shen, Emiliano de Ustova, Ilias Magulas, Steven Iwana, Arnab Chakraborty, and Karti Gururangan. Um, and as I already mentioned before we started uh, this uh, session, uh, David and uh, Christian asked me to say a little bit about Kappa cluster theory. Uh, and that's because of the diversity of the audience we have. Uh, so I'll try to say a little bit about it in the next few minutes. So um, I guess all of you know that uh, Kappa cluster theory originated uh, in those two very famous papers by Fritz Köster in 1958 and Jerzy Cizek uh, in 1966. Um, Fritz Köster suggested that we start using the exponential form of the wave function in solving the many fermion correlation problem. And then Jerzy Cizek followed through and uh, not only that he brought this exponential form of the wave function into the electronic structure theory, but he also uh, demonstrated how to deal with Kappa cluster equations using diagrammatic <laughs> techniques, how to come up with uh, sort of workable, programmable, as you would say today, probably, equations for amplitudes, for energy, uh, and how to compare Kappa clusters to other approaches like CI right, but... or MDPT. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so, um, so please all mute your microphone uh, unless you have questions. I think. Can you hear me? Because now everybody's muted. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, okay, good. That's yeah. better. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyway, um, so uh, in those two papers, uh, uh, among the various arguments in favor of Kappa cluster theory or in support, of Kappa cluster theory, uh, uh, I, were the uh, fundamental theorems of the many body uh, uh, theory uh, that uh, were uh, proved uh, in the late 50s uh, in the sort of glorious time for many body theory for setting foundations of it, namely the linked and connected cluster theorems. The connected cluster theorem that was proved uh, in 1957 by Hubbard and independently by Hugenholtz in the same year. Uh, says that if you take the linked contribution to the wave to link contributions to the wave function and if you sum them to the infinite order in the many body perturbation theory then you end up with a wave function that uh, 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 becomes to look like an exponential uh, and in this uh, exponential form of the wave function where phi is the reference determinant uh, uh, the cluster operator t as we would call it today uh, uh, is the sum of all the connected contributions to the wave function. So the way it works is that the connected diagrams uh, of the wave function are picked up by the cluster operator and the disconnected but linked contributions are picked up by powers of t, like t squared, t cubed, and so on. That's how you end up with an exponent. And of course, this has immediate consequences for the practical methods, because if we uh, apply the exponential wave function on Zatz with the connected form of the cluster operator, and if we solve the appropriate equations in a sort of proper way, then we end up with size extensive uh, uh, methods right away. Another argument that was particularly popular in those early days, but it's also uh, an argument that keeps coming back, uh, is the separability argument that was brought to us by Primas in the middle of the 60s, which simply says that uh, if you have a reference state that separates correctly, then the essentially the only mathematical form that allows you to separate the wave function and energy at the same time properly when you fragment the system, into non-interacting fragments is the exponential form, okay? So uh, of course, then the, the question is, what's the nature of the cluster operator? But you definitely can write up your wave function as an exponent. Um, so of course, since the, many years have passed since those early days. So today, Kappa cluster theory is a very lively field. 
um, you know, after the many decades of development. Uh, so it is not, no longer a, a single theory. We don't, you know, when you say kappa cluster theory, it's not one theory, it's really multiple theories that are sort of pursued independently. And I try to organize them um, in this chart, which I will try to walk you through. So uh, of course, the historically, the oldest uh, idea is the single reference kappa cluster idea, where we use a single Slater determinant to define the Fermi vacuum. But that doesn't mean that uh, this is sort of like other single reference methods of, uh, of, of quantum chemistry, say CI or perturbation theory, uh, because you can use the single slate determinant to define a Fermi vacuum, but you can still solve multi-reference problems by simply adding or remove electrons, removing all electrons, for example. So exploring the Fox space around the uh, uh, single Fermi vacuum, okay? So, so this is a, a you know, single reference couple cluster is a bit different than single reference, uh, say CI or single reference uh, perturbation theory. Uh, but among those single reference methods, of course, we have traditional methods, and that's how I'm going to call them, CCSD, CCSDT, CCSDTQ, CCSD parenthesis D, and, and other perturbative approximations to the full methods. We can also change the way uh, 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 of obtaining the cluster operator compared to what Cizek suggested in his 1966 paper. Uh, then we can end up with methods like uh, Arponen and Bishop's extended kappa cluster or variational kappa cluster. Uh, um, those are just different ways of obtaining cluster operator. We can, of course, consider add another operator to the co considerations uh, um, on top of sort of exponent, and then end up with equation of motion kappa cluster or uh, similar response kappa cluster methods to study excited electronic states, electron attached or ionized states, meaning actually studying uh, open shell systems around closed shells like radicals, biradicals, and things of that nature. By introducing the spin flipping cluster operator and starting from a high spin reference, uh, we can do spin flip kappa cluster methods uh, that allow us to study some multi reference problems. The same can be done with the so called method of moments or renormalized methods that I'll mention here. Uh, then, thanks to uh, uh, Alex Tom, we can also perform kappa cluster Monte Carlo calculations, where essentially instead of doing the deterministic uh, work on getting the cluster operator, you are simply trying to obtain it stochastically by Monte Carlo propagations. Uh, and of course, you know, following on this, one can combine stochastic methods uh, like uh, um, CI quantum Monte Carlo of, Al, uh, of, Al, of uh, Ali Alavi, uh, George Booth, Alex Tom and co-workers um, with, uh, with uh, say, uh, various couple cluster methods. Uh, you end up with semi-stochastic approaches. And, of, and we also can uh, look at the diagrammatics of kappa cluster and actually show that uh, in certain model Hamiltonians there are strict cancellations of diagrams so you can remove certain diagrams to actually uh, describe strong correlations in in uh, using uh, within a single reference on that but of course like you have with many other methods we have multi-reference methods as well in, in kappa cluster theory now there is no single way to, to define the sort of the wave function in a multi-reference kappa cluster theory so there are there is a number there is a number of different theories all being sort of uh, exact in the limit of full CI, but otherwise being different. We divide them typically into the so-called genuine, genuine approaches that use the Bloch wave operator formalism. And within that category, we have two types, the Hilbert space or state universal multi-reference kappa cluster methods and the Fox space or valence universal kappa cluster methods. And then uh, we have a very heterogeneous category of the so-called state selective methods. I listed uh, some examples, not all. This is by far not an exhaustive list. Okay, some of them like Brillo and Wigner multi reference kappa cluster or Mukherjee's, as we say uh, quite often these days, uh, kappa multi reference kappa cluster, uh, they uh, borrow on a little bit from the concepts of genuine methods like the Yezhorsky Monkers and Sats of state universal theory. Some of them, like internally contracted multi reference kappa cluster and, and others, do not do that. They simply are defined independently. Internal contracted multi reference kappa cluster is actually pursued quite nicely these days by Andreas Kohn. Um, then, of course, we can form hybrids. You know, that's not, I think that's something you would expect. Uh, so we can, for example, solve uh, first some uh, non kappa cluster, uh, with, for, for some non kappa cluster wave functions, say using CI or projected UHF or valence bond, on, or essentially some wave function that gives you a good information about certain parts of the electron correlations. And then we can simply plug it into the kappa cluster system to solve for the rest of the information, right? As in the so called external corrective methods. We can also mix up single and multi reference concepts. You can simply take the concept of active orbitals to, for example, solve for higher than two body cluster operators uh, in the single reference world. And in this way, you can describe multi reference problems within a single constraints of a single reference theory. And of course, one can go be very creative and go, uh, go outside all these uh, uh, sort of traditional methods and start redefining the cluster operator itself, 
we can make it unitary as you need it to couple cluster or tra canonical transformation theory. We can make it uh, generalized to body in a generalized couple cluster and, and, and so on. So we can explore all sorts of territories by, by doing uh, that kind of mathematics and sort of illustrate why this is such a rich field. Uh, I, I sort of have these equations in, in the animated form. So suppose, you know, I'm looking at the single reference couple cluster on Zats, where phi is the reference determinant and uh, T is the cluster operator. And suppose I'm, I'm interested in getting information about higher than two body cluster operators, go beyond CCSD. I already have many choices. I can try to determine them straight from the Schrodinger equation. That would be the full methods like CCSDT, CCSDTQ and higher. But I don't have to do that. I can try to estimate them from many body perturbation theory. That means you end up with methods like parenthesis T or you know, some other perturbative approximations. I listed some of them here. You can try to extract T3, T4 and higher clusters from non kappa cluster wave functions that behave better than say traditional single reference kappa cluster methodology. That's an, an idea of external corrected methods. You can try to select them using active orbitals. Now you can try to go into some sort of a world of multi-reference uh, description without, go, become, without really doing multi-reference uh, uh, calculations. You can extract them the information about T3, T4 from moment expansions. And, and there are many other ways. I'm just showing a few examples. And if you are sort of bored with, a sing, with the ground state calculations, you can go to excited states. You can add an extra operator in front of the exponent. And now you can build theories for excited states, electron attached states, ionized states, um, uh, which means that you can study not only ex electronic excitations, but also, but also electronic spectra of radicals, diradicals, triradicals, and so on. Um, and again, you can develop various approximate techniques to determine higher the components of the T and the R operators here. And if one exponent is not enough, you can always make it more complicated. You can have multiple exponents. You can form a superposition of different exponential and Z set, right? For each reference determinant phi P, now you have a clustered operator and you form a linear combination. And uh, that leads, that's the famous Jorsky monkers and Zatz which leads to methods like state universal multi-reference couple cluster theory if you use block wave operator formalism or the sp state specific versions that I'm showing here, the Mukherjee and Brilliant Vigor MRCC. And you can go even beyond that because you can define a so-called valence universal cluster operator S, which, allow, which is now operating in the Fox space. You know, not just the many electron Hilbert space with fixed number of electrons, but in the Fox space, okay? Now you can really study uh, a lot of uh, open shell systems in this way. And as I said, you can always go back to the origins of Kappa cluster theory, replace the, class, the particle hole excitation operator T by say unitary form, uh, T minus T dagger or, or some other unitary form uh, or say the general, so general two body operator and so on and so forth. But in this talk, I'll keep it simple. I'll go back to the sort of original single reference Kappa cluster theory. Okay, which I already mentioned. So we already know what it is. Phi is the reference determinant, T is the cluster operator and uh, uh, those are the acronyms for the approximations we create by truncating typically the cluster operator expansion at a given many body rank. So you have T2, when you stop at T2, you have CCSD. When you stop at T3, you have CCSDT and so on. And those are the equations that you normally have to solve in Kappa cluster theory, in the traditional single reference Kappa cluster theory. We obtain them using following essentially the recipe of Cizek, project the Schrodinger equation with the Kappa cluster wave function in it on the excited slater determinants that correspond to the content of the cluster operator. That's how you get the amplitude equations. When you solve, after solving this nonlinear system, we compute the energy by projecting the Schrodinger equation on the reference determinant T. And as I mentioned already, uh, the exponential and that guarantees several useful properties such as size extensivity. But of course the property that is, uh, makes all of us happy in terms of practicality is the fact that we have a very fast convergence toward the full CI limit. Um, when, uh, you know, that it's, you know, by the time you reach method uh, approximations like full T or full CCDTQ, we essentially recover pretty much the entire correlation effect, uh, effects, uh, uh, the entire correlation and uh, um, uh, correlation uh, that is sort of relevant to many problems of interest. Not only molecules near the equilibrium geometries, uh, you can also show that this is true when you break bonds. Um, for example, I have an example here of water molecule. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be breaking two bonds at the same time and, and comparing kappa cluster to full CI. Uh, and you can see that by the time I have full T, I already am having very small errors. Uh, uh, and when I put quadruples in the form of CCTQ, I am pretty much converged up to at least twice the equilibrium bond length uh, in this case. So this is a multi-reference problem. And we can solve it because I'm not involving here a lot of entangled, strongly entangled electrons. Okay, that's just uh, you know, a few electrons. Of course, if I had 50 strongly entangled electrons, that would not work. 
So there is a class of strongly correlated problems like metal insulated transistors where, where this would fail. Uh, but there are many problems in chemistry, single double bond breaking and so on that you can study in this way. So, so one of the main goals then of kappa cluster theory over the years has been how to incorporate higher than two body components of the cluster operator um, um, in some computationally efficient way because the polynomial costs of CCDTQ or CCDT are, are too high, you know, n to the 10, n to the nine, eight scalings. Um, traditional solution has been to use perturbation theory, but perturbation theory is not a good way to do it because it is not robust enough. You can see here what, say, a method called CCSD parenthesis T, where we correct CCSD for triples in perturbation theory, uh, you know, produces for, say, uh, uh, covalent bond breaking. You end up with this uh, strangely shaped uh, potential curve, which is not physically correct. Um, and you can see all kinds of erratic behavior when you study by radicals and so on. So, of course, you know, one has to do something about it. And, uh, you know, there are many solutions, but uh, uh, the solution I would like to focus on today is uh, what we call uh, moment energy expansions in our group. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a specific formulation called CCPQ, where the idea is as follows. Essentially, the idea is very straightforward, actually. It's an idea of correcting the results of low order kappa cluster calculations for higher order correlation effects, but do it in a non-perturbative manner. So the way we do it is this. Suppose, uh, let's assume that I know what are the important determinants in the wave functions, in the wave function of interest. So I'm going to define the subspace of the Hilbert space that contains these determinants. I'm going to call it the P space. We're going to solve Kappa cluster or EOMCC equations in that P space. That gives us a sort of a zero order description. And then we're going to correct the results of such calculations for the remaining correlation effects that can be captured by another subspace of the Hilbert space, which I call the Q space. There are equations behind all of this, um, you know, and I don't think we'll be reading every symbol, the, but the main message of these equations is that the correction delta, which is actually the key here, uh, is not written as a, some sort of an MVPT type expression. It's a linear combination of moments, and those moments, as you can see in the oval here, are projections of the Schrodinger equation with the Kappa cluster wave function obtained in the P space on the complementary determinants from the Q space. That's the idea. Um, so now the question is how to use such um, uh, expansions in practice. Well, of course, you can use it in a conventional way. If I wanted to correct CCSD energy for, say, triples, similar, something that you would normally do with parentheses T, uh, I will define the P space to be single and double excited determinants, Q space to be triple excited determinants. And if I use the equations from the previous slide, um, I end up with CRCC23, the completely normalized Kappa cluster method with singles, doubles, that's the two, corrected for the triples, that's the three. Of course, you can always pick up more determinants in your P and Q spaces and create more acronyms. We're not going to worry too much about that. This is just a re reminder that says that method, methods like this, are they're, they're, because they are non-perturbative corrections, better than perturbative ones, are much more robust when you break bonds. So here's an illustration. This is uh, uh, F2. I would like to recover the full CCSDT energy. That's what CCSD produces. Of course, that's not good. Parenthesis D produces a wrong shape of the potential curve because of its failure at larger uh, internuclear separations. And that's what CRCC23, the non-perturbative, the moment correction uh, uh, added to CCSD uh, gives us. So it's a much better performance. Um, but of course, you know, there are always situations where you can fail these met methods. Uh, and um, here's an example. I don't need to go to anything actually complicated. I can pick up the automatization cycle with the dime, the simple rearrangement of the pi electrons, okay? And as you can see, CRCC23 produces a very bad activation energy compared to the desired result, uh, which is here given by CCSDT. So why is that? And that, that's not because we, have, we need more correlations than triples. No, CCSDT already has connected triples, so we are fine here. Uh, the problem is that there is a significant, in this case, coupling among lower the clusters, in this case, T1 and T2, and the higher the clusters, that is T3. And simply, when you try to correct say CCSD energy for triples, you are assuming that there is no coupling between those two. But actually there is a coupling. In this case, it's very significant. So we need to put it back. How to do this? Well, you can choose different ways. One way would be, since we have, we have some experience with how to sort of, how to define the proper P and Q spaces, we can say define the P space to be singles, single and double excited determinants. You're gonna take those of course always. And then a subset of triplex determinants, which you can identify using active orbitals. There is a category of methods, which we call active space kappa cluster methods, where you can do such things. Um, one of them is called CCSD little t. And then instead of correcting for all triples, um, I will correct for the remaining triples. The dominant triples are in the P space, the remaining ones in the Q space. When you do this, you end up with this acronym. 
that's the method you can try yourself. It's in the games package, uh, like all our, many other methods from our group. Um, and this one I can tell you works very well. These kinds of methods work very well. They will reproduce the energies of higher order calculations like CCSDT or CCDTQ to within 0.1 millihertz tree. There's only one caveat here though, that I have to know what to put in a P space and I'm using active orbitals, which means that this is not a black box. You know, you have to provide information about active orbitals. Okay, so we decided to explore uh, sort of more automated ways of defining P and Q spaces. And the idea that came, came you know, that we really focused on uh, is the idea of fusing the CCPQ theory with the stochastic CI and Kappa cluster, Monte Carlo considerations. And in, in that stochastic part, we rely on the wonderful work by Ali Alavi, George Booth, and Alex Tom, uh, who developed the CI and Kappa cluster Monte Carlo ideas. Uh, I am assuming that um, the audience knows more or less what quantum Monte Carlo is. This is quantum Monte Carlo in the Hilbert space. Uh, so what I'll do, I'll just explain uh, what do we, how do we incorporate Monte Carlo information into our deterministic calculations. So let you know, this is an example, the F2 molecule, I'm, I stretch, stretch the bond by a factor of two. And, and, you know, in this example, and that's on purpose, because, you know, at this uh, example, what happens is that when you stretch F2 by a factor, of, uh, uh, the bond length by a factor of two, then the three, three body cluster effect, the th effect of T3 clusters, is larger than the dissociation energy. So it's a massive uh, correlation effect. Okay, the top panel shows you what happened, how the Walker population grows as you propagate the wave function along the imaginary time axis. So the sort of the iterations axis is essentially the imaginary time axis, the propagation axis. Um, and the bottom panel shows you the convergence of, in this case, full CI QMC toward its limit. So what are we gonna do about this is something very straightforward actually. You know, we're gonna simply take a snapshot or take a peek. What kind of Slater determinants is Monte Carlo picking up for us? Okay, we can look at this list of determinants picked up by Monte Carlo in the beginning of the, uh, of the time propagation. We can look later, we can always look later. Obviously, as you keep looking later and later, the list of determinants gets longer and longer. Some determinants begin to accumulate more walkers because they are more important in the wave function. But you see, we're not gonna be really paying attention to all the details like this we'll be just taking a simple binary decision. If a determinant that, suppose I want to pick up the dominant triples. Well, I will look at the Monte Carlo uh, output. And if the, the triple excitation is on the list provided by Monte Carlo, we'll put it in a P space. And then we solve Kappa cluster equations with that information. And if the determinant is not on the list yet at a given time, we'll correct for it using our moment expansions. Okay, that's all. This is a very simple uh, strategy. And I'll show you that the strategy can work very well. You know, so to summarize, we'll be doing what uh, this slide is explaining, that uh, we can, def if the P space is defined as singles, doubles, and a subset of triples, the list of triples provided by Monte Carlo, and the Q space is then the remaining triples in our CCPQ theory, then we can converge CCSDT. And if the P space has singles, doubles, and a subset of triples and quadruples extracted from the list of determinants in Monte Carlo runs, uh, and the Q space are the remaining triples and quadruples, we can converge CCSD to Q and so on. And this is an illustration. You look at the F2 molecule. Um, now I'm going from the equilibrium bond length uh, to all the way to five times equilibrium. So I'm breaking the bond. The green line is the full CI quantum Monte Carlo propagation along the uh, uh, time axis. You know, those iterations are, uh, uh, pro uh, you know, we call them iterations, but those are time steps of Monte Carlo. I zoomed the energy scale. So of course you see the stochastic noise uh, because now I'm talking about millihertz trees. Um, that's what happens when you solve Kappa cluster equations on the list of determinants provided by Monte Carlo. Uh, okay, so, it, so here I'm simply taking the list of triples provided by Monte Carlo and I solve Kappa cluster equations deterministically and I end up with very nice convergence toward full CCSDT already. But we can improve that by adding now corrections to, due to missing. Uh, triples that are not on the list provided by Monte Carlo at the given time step. And you end up with these flat, uh, very rapidly converging uh, curves uh, marked uh, by these uh, black uh, squares, okay? So as you can see, we're able to converge the desired CCSDT results uh, out of the early stages of Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo is extremely good in telling you what are the important components of the wave function already in the early stages, and we essentially benefit from it greatly. Uh, here I'm using full CI quantum Monte Carlo. Of course, we don't have to do that. We can replace it by simpler forms of Monte Carlo like CISDTQ, which means that I'm not allowing spawning beyond quadruples or CISDT. 
So now it's an even simpler. Of course, this, this Monte Carlo converges to a different limit than before, but to us, it is not important because all we need from it is the list of triples in this case, right? And uh, all of these Monte Carlo simulations will provide those lists. And here I'm using Alex Tom's uh, CCSDT Monte Carlo uh, uh, that you can find in his uh, wonderful code called Handy. Uh, you can see the, uh, uh, again, the fast convergence, you know, essentially pictures are not changing. And, you know, if you wonder, what about the basis set? Well, not really. Actually, we benefit for large base sets even more. Uh, so this is an example of augmented triple zeta. You can see the fast convergence again. If you just follow the black curves with black squares on them all the time. Uh, and of course, there are great benefits in terms of uh, accelerations of the calculations because essentially what happens, you benefit from three effects. The first effect is that Kappa cluster cal uh, Monte Carlo calculations in the beginning are very fast, okay? Um, then Kappa cluster calculations on the small fractions of triples that you, that's all you can get actually from Monte Carlo in the beginning, uh, are also very fast compared to the traditional Kappa cluster calculations. And then the corrections, these moment corrections, are less expensive than a single iteration of CCSDT. So we have these sort of uh, three-way uh, speed ups uh, uh, in the process. Uh, and going back to the cyclobutadiene the example, which I mentioned, we had this trouble with the getting the activation energy right. Remind, let me remind you that we had this error of 8k cal per mol with CCSD parenthesis t, uh, and actually CRCC23 also gave us a similarly large error. But you can see with just about 15% of triples in the P space, I can get down this error to about the k cal per mol level. Okay, so so again we have this acceleration uh, of convergence toward the desired in this case full CCSD limit. That's more of the same. I'm showing uh, reactant and products, uh, sorry, reactant and transition state. Uh, on and separate sort of uh, set of plots. Uh, if you just look at the black squares and black lines, uh, you can see that fast convergence again. And you can do it at any level of theory. Uh, in the interest of time, maybe I'll bypass it. You can uh, see if you just look at the last column that we have a very fast convergence in this case toward CCSDTQ in a very difficult situation where full CCSDT is complete failure. You need T4 clusters this uh, at three times the equilibrium bond length for uh, OH bonds. Okay, we have a very fast convergence again. And we can see the same fast convergence for excited states because we can switch to equation of motion Kappa cluster and use Monte Carlo to, to provide us lists of excitations in EOMCC. So this is a calculation for the sort of a, a, a benchmark problem CH plus uh, where we can get full EOMCC SDT uh, with no problem. Uh, and you can see the, here the errors relative to full EOMCC SDT. This is without the corrections for a number of excited states. Some of them are actually double excited, like these delta states or the two sigma. Some of them are single excited. So it's a mix. This is what happens when you have add the correction due to missing triples. Essentially, we have an instantaneous convergence. This is an equilibrium geometry. We can go outside the equilibrium. This is twice the equilibrium bond length, where all excited states are strongly multi reference now. And still, we have a very fast convergence toward full EUMC CSDT, which itself is, in this case, essentially exact, very close to full CI. Okay. Um, and we can do the same for single triple gaps of, uh, of say, rad by radicals. I have lots of examples here, but I will, again, I'll probably skip them. Uh, but if you just look at this uh, plot here, you can see how fast we can converge again, this time a single triplet gap, or individual energies for the single and the triplet at the CCSDT level. Um, and, uh, but as I said, you know, in this exploration uh, of these ideas, we don't have to be using only Monte Carlo. We try, you know, nowadays there's this uh, revived uh, interest in um, uh, uh, selected CI methods, uh, renewed interest. Um, so we said, okay, why don't we try selected CI methods, which are also sort of automated essentially uh, as the source of information about what to put in the P space. So we decided to consider what I call here a fourth way. Okay. And in that fourth way, we implemented CCPQ methods using SIPC. Uh, that was mentioned in one of the earlier talks. Again, the same example, F2, we go from equilibrium to five times equilibrium. You look at the black lines, that's what you end up with. Uh, you can see this rapid convergence. That is we, what this means here is that we can run SIPC with very small diagonalization spaces, in this case, essentially thousands, and we already are converged. We're getting uh, full CCSDT uh, uh, out of it. And this is essentially another example. If you look at the last column, again, you can see the very rapid convergence uh, of the barrier for the automatization of cyclobutadiene. Okay, we get uh, with about 100,000 determinants, we don't have to go to millions, right? Uh, in the SIPC space, we can already get uh, sort of a K Calper more type uh, accuracy, right? So SIPC is also very uh, effective. It has this nice feature. At the end, you know, in the last couple of minutes that I have or don't have, let me just mention that uh, we can also extend these ideas to 
to methods that actually aim at full CI directly. In other words, not at some high level Kappa cluster, CCADT or Q and so on, but at full CI. There's this observation that is actually not a new one, uh, which goes back to uh, the time I worked with Joe Faldus and Chizek and in the 90s, uh, which, um, uh, which uh, simply is as follows. When you look at the Schrodinger equation of the Kappa cluster wave function, and you look at projections on single and double excited determinants, and you do not neglect anything, you will see that all the only cluster operators that you need to write these equations are T1 through T4. You don't have more than T4 because the Hamiltonian is a two-body operator, so it doesn't couple single and double excited determinants with anything higher than quadruples. So this is telling us that if I take T3 and T4 from full CI, and if I solve for T1 and T2 clusters in the presence of T3 and T4 from full CI, I'm gonna get the exact T1, T2, which means the exact energy. Okay, um, that's an idea which we exist under the name of external corrected Kappa cluster methods. And in the past, uh, various people used uh, various uh, sources of uh, T3 and T4 uh, using projected UHF or valence bond or multi reference CI or CAS SCF and so on and so forth. But today we have Monte Carlo, full CI Monte Carlo, which we know is a very good source of information. It converges toward full CI by definition. So we can have an algorithm start with full CI quantum Monte Carlo propagation. Uh, at a given propagation time, look at the wave function, count the walkers at various determinants and determine the CI coefficients, um, perform cluster analysis to end up with the T3 and T4 clusters corresponding to the full Monte, full, uh, Monte Carlo uh, wave function, solve for T1, T2 in the presence of T3 and T4 from Monte Carlo, and we know for sure that in the limit of infinite time, this converges to full CI. So that's the, uh, we call this method CAD FCI QMC. Uh, it's sort of a semi-stochastic version of FCI QMC. Okay, here's in one illustration. So if you look at the double bond break in water, once again, we go from equilibrium all the way to twice the equilibrium. The green line is the full CI QMC run using initiator approach. I know you can improve that, but uh, right now that's what we use. Uh, and the red line represents the result of our calculation where we solve for T1, T2 in the presence of T3 T and T4 from Monte Carlo. You can see the same in numbers. Uh, if, but I'm not sure if I were interested in reading all these numbers. Uh, the yellow fields with red numbers show you how nicely we converge toward full CI. Uh, and my last example that I think I can afford uh, in the next minute um, will be this one. Of course, we all, always talk these days about strong correlation. It's a, it's a recurring topic, of course. Uh, you know, people talked about had talked about strong correlation for a long, longer time. Uh, I call it the final frontier. Please forgive me. There's nothing final in science. I sort of. Uh, hesitated putting this uh, quotation, but I'm a fan of Star Trek. So for me, final frontier is, is, the, is the right word, I guess. Um, uh, anyway, so you know, let's look at strong correlation uh, and let's see if these ideas can be extended to strong correlation. So I'm looking at, uh, you know, uh, Eugene talked about uh, hydrogen clusters, which has, are, can be used as models of uh, metal insulated transitions. So I'm looking at the ring of 10 hydrogen atoms here. We go from the metallic phase with weaker correlations to the insulating phase defined by 10 uh, hydrogen atoms, isolated atoms, insulating phase with strong correlations, okay? Now, this is a tricky thing for Kappa cluster because uh, now the normal hierarchy of approximations, CCSD, T, Q, and so on, is not converging in a sort of uh, normal way to full CI. In fact, uh, the cluster that will be actually most important here might be T10, okay? It's sort of almost a reverse uh, situation compared to the weaker correlation regime, okay? Uh, and the situation is so bad that if you look at here at these potential curves, you can see that I cannot, I don't continue them anymore. So what happens? You end up with a branch point singularity actually, and then you go to a complex plane. How bad, that's how bad the failure of traditional Kappa cluster approaches here is. So, but we're still gonna deal with it. So we're gonna take our CAD FCI QMC algorithm. We're gonna extract T3, T4 from Monte Carlo. And now we have to do one more thing because if we just did that, that wouldn't be very good because at, in the beginning of propagation, Monte Carlo propagation, T3 and T4 is zero. So then you are forced to solve CCSD equations. But as I'm showing here, in this region, you cannot do this. You go to a complex plane, okay? So we're gonna do something else. We're gonna look at T2 square. It, it was shown by Joe Paldus, Jerzy Cizek and myself uh, in the 90s, that when you analyze T2 square diagrams, then you can show that some of them are responsible for strong correlations and some of them are responsible for weak correlations. So we can partition the diagrams. I'm not showing the diagrams, but you know, let's just use some numbering scheme. Uh, you can partition these diagrams. And then the ones that I am marking here in black are those that are responsible for strong correlations. We'll be treating them 
deterministically, okay? And those which are responsible for weaker correlations in red will be treated with Monte Carlo. So when I do all of this, uh, that's my last essentially uh, plot. You can see I'm plotting here uh, the errors relative to full CI as a function of the HH distance in a ring, okay? Um, here uh, you can see what Monte Carlo does after 50,000, 100,000, 150,000 uh, iterations. It does converge, but you can see that even under, after 150,000 Monte Carlo steps, uh, step is 10 to the minus four here. So it's 15 atomic units, I believe. Uh, we have an error of about 10, 10 millihard three. Of course, eventually I can, I can reduce it to zero, but you can see I can reduce it to zero much quicker if I perform this CAD FCI QMC calculations with this repartitioning of T2 square. You can see that already after, 100,000 iterations, we have a very nice, ni nice errors on which are really, eventually we can get them down to millihard three uh, uh, with no problem. So with this, I will end uh, by simply saying that I, I, you know, in preparing slides, of course, you usually we prepare more slides than we can afford. So um, we also try to develop external corrected Kappa cluster methods based on selected CI, based on SIPC specifically. Uh, but in the process of doing so, we uncovered some interesting features uh, of external corrupted Kappa cluster formulas uh, and in comparison to truncated CI. So I do recommend that you read this paper. It was published earlier this year. Uh, you can see what these uh, uh, interesting features are. And you can also, you can also see uh, the, uh, the results of our uh, SIPC based uh, external corrected Kappa cluster calculus. I'll stop right here with my thank you slide if I can get there. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for your patience and attention. And I look forward to your uh, comments or questions. Yeah, thank you so much for giving us this overview of the cover clusters and what can we do. So if you have any questions in the chat or just raise your hand or you can go directly and ask the question. I see David is the first, David. So Peter, I have a quick question on, so when you're uh, getting the determinants for the Monte Carlo, um, how, do you have an idea of like whether a determinant is representing, for example, a connected term or an unconnected term? Yeah, so, um, uh, well, actually, okay. This is a very good question, actually. Um, so first of all, uh, uh, every triple excitation uh, uh, will always have a connected part. It may not have a disconnected part, right? But mm -hmm. we don't have to worry about it because it's essentially, you know, if you think about Kappa cluster system, how would I solve CCSDT equations? I would consider projections on singles, doubles, and triples. You know, the list of determinants. Normally, I would include all triples, of course, which mm -hmm. of course may, would make these costs horrendous, right, right? I can select those triples, of course, using active orbitals or some other trick. But here we're just telling, okay, can we just get the list from Monte Carlo? So it's a very simple idea, you know, with, without, you know, yeah, the, the concerns, right? Because you're gonna, right, it's right, like, right. So, essentially you can think of solving Kappa cluster equations on a subset of triples in your T, T operator which I can always create. Right, right guided by the Monte Carlo calculation. You know, yeah, and Monte Carlo is simply this provider of the meaningful list. Uh, so I don't have to scratch my head about what to put there, right? All right. Yeah. Okay, order. very nice talk. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go to Dominica. Uh, Piotr, I have a question. I could see that you have EOM uh, CC. So this is for neutral excited states. Do you guys intend to produce the IP and TA and we could use oh, yes, the screen's yes. function? Uh, 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 well, uh, yes, uh, this is actually one of my students, Arnab, who is here. Where is Arnab? Arnab, here. here. Uh, yeah, right. so Arnab is working on this already. He already actually has the results. You know, we have not published this, but he already showed me results. And of course, we'll extend to DA, DIP. Uh, you know, obviously, right. you know, once you start this kind of work, you know, you have to finish, right? <laughs> so yes, we will. That, that would be very interesting. We could. But we of course, could if you're interested in EAP, uh, you know, we, we, you know, of course, the normal ones, the active space ones, you know, are in games now. Uh, we are now putting DA, DIP, but uh, that will be, of course, uh, very exciting because this, uh, I, I really like this uh, stochastic work. Uh, it's such a, such an objective sort of in a way, right? Uh, provider of information about higher correlations, right? That we don't have to simply define some a priori. What do I think is important? What's not important? Monte Carlo is telling us this information. Right, in a very nice way. So I enjoy this uh, work. Uh, All work. right, we get back to you with impurities. When we okay, okay, you. absolutely. Look forward to it. And yeah, maybe last question with Ilham. Uh, hello, thanks for the talk. Uh, Thank you. I want to know that uh, can we use them for the system with near degenerated like uh, transition metals? Of course, you know, uh, 
we haven't done this with the methods I described. Of course, we did work on transition metals uh, with other types of, like CRC2, we did. So the, the, they, they work, I don't see any, you know, with transition metals, uh, uh, parenthesis may be a problem. Uh, perturbative metals may be, this moment corrections are much more robust. So we can try that and, 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 uh, and this, so we know this already from, from, you know, studies of, I don't know what would be a good example. We did gold nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles. We did uh, metal cobalamine. I don't know, I can, I have to look at our papers. Yeah, but uh, uh, in general, I have, you know, no concerns other than of course, now the question might be, uh, what about relativity? Of course, then we'll scale relativity is very easy for us. LS coupling, we cannot do that at this point, right? So if that becomes an issue, then of course you have to worry about it, right? Yes, yes, yeah. thanks, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, if there are more questions, please put them in the chat and, and you can also discuss it later. So let's move on to the second talk by Dominique Eschkett.